Well, it's coming up towards the end of August, and pretty soon it'll have been a month since Windows 10 was released to the general public, with quite a bit of fanfare. Of course, one of the main features of Windows 10 that a lot of folk, myself included, have been waiting patiently for is the return of the start menu. And I have to say that Microsoft did not disappoint on this front. I think what they've done um, is they've managed to combine the ease of use and the convenience of the traditional start menu with the innovative features of the new user interface that debuted with Windows 8. Things such as the live tiles, for example. It's really difficult to believe that it's now 20 years since the start menu debuted in its original form with Windows 95. Hello everyone, and welcome to this video Song Frontier special. This is a special video on Microsoft Windows 95. On the 24th of August 2015, this revolutionary version of Windows will turn 20 years old. But what was so great about Windows 95? Why was it released with such fanfare? I mean, American TV host Jay Leno, who at the time hosted The Tonight Show, was at the launch of Windows 95. He was sharing his thoughts and feelings on the operating system, on stage actually, delivering all of these thoughts in the way that only Jay Leno can. Windows 95 even starred in its own so-called cyber sitcom um, that featured Jennifer Aniston and Matthew Perry, who at the time were in a wee show called Friends. You might have heard of it. It's some sort of a sitcom thing based in front of a live studio audience. Filmed in front of a live studio audience, rather. Yeah, that thing. Anyway, what was it about this operating system that had such big name stars endorsing it, or at least appearing in publicity about it. I mean, at the end of the day, this was just a computer program. That's all any operating system is. Something that would have really only appealed to folk who are actually into computers. And yes, I know that Charlie Chaplin appeared in adverts about the original IBM PC, the 5150, back in the 1980s, but let's be honest here. How does the number of people who watch Charlie Chaplin's films in the 80s compare with the number of people who watched The Tonight Show with Jay Leno or Friends in 1995? In this video, I'd like to take a look at where Windows 95 came from, what it had to compete against, what hurdles were experienced along the way, and of course, what Windows 95 actually turned out like once it was released. So, please sit back, grab a cup of tea or a glass of iron brew, grab a couple of OTs or Tunnock's tea cakes, sit back and relax, and let's take a look at Windows 95. When personal computers first came out in the 1970s, they were extremely difficult to use. Indeed, the Metz Altair 8800, the machine which is considered by many to be the first personal computer was extremely difficult to use. Generally, you'd buy it as a wee kit that you'd build yourself just so that you could turn it on and find out that it doesn't work. Great. If, however, you did manage to get that thing going, you could probably successfully com be convicted of witchcraft and be hung from the Tower of London by the scruff of your plague shirt, you absolute nerdle. Kidding on, but what if you did get the thing going? You would then put data into it by flipping a series of switches on the front of the machine back and forth until you had the program fully inputted. That was if you knew how to flip the switches in such a way that you could write a meaningful program. The result of the program did not appear on any kind of a screen originally. Rather, it would be outputted through a row of LED lights on the front 
And you then have to decode what the blinking patterns of lit and un unlit LEDs actually meant. Of course, the Altair had a pretty powerful expansion bus for its time. And soon expansion cards became available that would actually allow the thing to interface with a keyboard, a screen, a printer and data storage. This made the machine ultimately much more usable. At this time, a young Bill Gates and Paul Allen, fresh out of college, um, saw this opportunity and developed a version of BASIC that would run on the Altair. And thus, Microsoft was born. But so too was a slightly easier way to interface with personal computers. Operating systems became available that would actually manage the computer's hardware that would interface with the user through a command line interface. And these were actually known as disk operating systems or DOSes. You'd actually have to type commands into the computer to tell it what to do. And it was slightly easier than actually having to write the programs yourself just to make it do basic things, but really not that much easier. While this was a lot easier than flipping rows of switches and deciphering the output through rows of blinking LEDs, it really was far from simple. However, in the 70s, at Xerox Park Palo Alto Research Center, another much better way to interface with the computer was being dreamed up. Xerox developed a prototype computer system. Um, it was known as the uh, Xerox Star, I do believe. Um, and the way that it worked is that users could interface using windows, icons, mouse uh, menus and pointers. Yeah, literally, WIMPs. <laughs> That's actually the acronym. Um, specifically, they could use a mouse to control an on-screen pointer to point and click on things to interact with them and thus the computer. Xerox invited Steve Jobs, along with a few other employees from Apple, to Park to see the new system. On seeing Xerox's new graphical user interface concept, Apple knew that GUIs were going to be the way forward, GUI being graphical user interface by the way, and that command line interfaces or CLIs would become a thing of the past, at least for mo most mainstream users. Of course, you do get a handful of Linux nuts that uh, like to use it um, as well, even today. Um, with that in mind, Steve Jobs rushed back to Apple like an excited child, said, Hey lads, look at what I found. This is amazing. This is the future. And with that, they set to work on Lisa. Um, now, Lisa was a computer that featured a graphical user interface similar to the one that Steve Jobs and his other employees saw at Xerox Park. Unfortunately though, the computer turned out to be a failure. It was very powerful, you know, very powerful for the time, but unfortunately it cost a lot of money. I mean, a few people did buy them, but yeah, the, it really didn't sell in massive numbers. However, what Lisa did do was lay down the foundations for another machine that Apple was working on. This one was quite a lot less powerful actually. I mean, it had 128 kilobytes of memory compared to the Lisa's muscular one megabyte. However, it was a lot cheaper as a result of a lot of these sacrifices. This machine became the original Macintosh. Oh yeah, that thing. 
And while, to, while it too did not initially sell too well, it did show the rest of the world that graphical user interfaces were the way forward. At the time, IBM PCs and their compatibles were running either PC-DOS or MS-DOS, depending on whether it was a, an IBM machine or simply compatible. Now, DOS, MS-DOS, is uses a command line interface. However, Microsoft were working at the time on a graphical user interface of their own, originally called the Interface Manager. That, however, did become Windows. Unfortunately, the first version of Windows did not necessarily receive much popularity, and due to Apple having copyrighted the um, look and feel, as it were, of the Macintosh system software, Microsoft chose not to implement the overlapping windows. If there were multiple windows on the screen, they would be tiled. However, in 1987, Microsoft's Windows 2 debuted, and it gained a lot more popularity than its predecessor had done. This was due in part to the runtime versions of Windows 2 being included with Microsoft Word for Windows and Microsoft Excel. But what's a runtime version of Windows, Jay? I heard you asking. Well, what that was, was a version of the Windows environment that would actually run once you started Microsoft Word or Excel, but would then close on exiting either Word or Excel. However, something else happened which really did cement Windows's uh, popularity at the time. Aldus actually released a version of PageMaker for Windows. Now this originally was only available on the Macintosh, which had at that time become the platform for desktop publishing, you know, given its graphical user interface. Well, PageMaker had only been available on the Macintosh, it was now available on PCs, and was therefore the first third-party application that had been developed for Microsoft's Windows platform. Now, while Windows 1 and 2 were easier to use than plain old DOS, they were actually all quite cumbersome. Starting programs, for example, was not as easy as in Windows as it was in the Macintosh. You'd actually have to browse through a sea of files and folders to find the programs executable that you wanted to actually run. That is because Windows 1 and 2 were what you would call file centric. Basically, it would just be a graphical way to show all your folders and files. There was really no program icons apart from if you minimized a program, you know, it wasn't like you would actually see an icon for Microsoft Word, and then you'd double click it and then you'd be in Word. At the time though, Microsoft were actually working on another operating system with IBM. And this was called OS2. At the time, Microsoft had said about Windows that it was really just a placeholder. You know, just kind of something to tide you over until OS2 came out. Now, while the presentation manager which was OS2's user interface at the time, was considerably easier to use than Windows. The system requirements need, that were needed to run it were considerably higher than those needed to run DOS and Windows. However, OS2 was actually a much more powerful system for the time. Now, while Microsoft and IBM had been jointly developing OS2 since 1985 when they actually uh, signed the joint development agreement, the relationship broke down. And this was at the time of Microsoft Windows 3.0's release. From then on, Microsoft and IBM did go their separate ways with Windows and OS2, respectively. Obviously, you know, there was a lot of reasons for uh, the breakup of Microsoft and IBM and uh, the development of OS2. But to be honest, I mean, it is quite a long and complex thing and really, that should be the, uh, the subject for another video. 
Now, Windows 3.0 was released in May 1990 and was the first version that was actually a real rival to both Apple's Macintosh and Commodore's Amiga GUI-based systems. Yes, Windows 2.0 had gained popularity from Windows 1.0, but Windows 3.0 was just better. It was the first version to feature the Program Manager, which replaced the MS-DOS Executive as the default shell. And Program Manager was actually program-centric, in that you would work with programs rather than working with files, like you would have in the MS-DOS Executive. However, if you did need to manage files, and let's be honest, you're on a computer, you will need to manage files, the file manager was there, and that actually did replace the MS-DOS executive. Now, it looked and behaved a lot like MS-DOS executive, but with quite a few improvements, one of which was a multi-document interface, so you could actually look at multiple folders, um, on your one screen at the same time. Now, Windows 3.0 did have a couple of releases, including Windows 3.0a, which included some bug fixes, and Windows 3.0 Multimedia Edition, which was sold with so-called multimedia upgrade kits that you could buy for IBM-compatible PCs. See, these would feature something like uh, CD-ROM drives, sound cards, and if you were really lucky or you were really behaving well and were a good little boy or girl or you spoke really, really nicely to the kindly shop assistant, might even get a pair of speakers thrown in as well. Now, Windows 3.0 Multimedia Edition featured support for uh, sound cards and I do believe it featured screensavers, which is something that the original Windows 3.0 had not featured, among a few other things. Now, in May of 1992, Windows 3.0 was replaced by Windows 3.1. Now, Windows 3.1, like Windows 3.0, featured the Program Manager. It also had built-in support for multimedia and improved on the foundations that Windows 3.0 had laid down. In my opinion, it was this version of Windows that really put Windows on the map as a real choice for consumers. However, just like with previous versions of Windows, it too had usability issues, as I'm now away to demonstrate. So, if you are using a consumer operating system by Microsoft back in 1993 or 1994, this is what you would have seen, or at least minus um, the wee bit at the bottom there, um, where the resolution doesn't exactly match up to the wee window that I'm recording within. But let's imagine that you're new to computers. You switch yours on. And you get this screen of black writing. A black background and with the grey writing on it, rather. What do you do here? And what's more is that your friend's PC, it might have completely different grey writing on a black background. What do I do here? Uh, I, I want it to do something. Uh, uh, I want to start the computer. Do I type bad commander file name? Okay. Uh, I want to do some writing. Right. This program requires Microsoft Windows. Ah, now, this program requires Microsoft Windows. How do I get Windows? Do I type in Windows? Nope, that won't do anything either. Now, <clears throat> luckily I was taught um, how to use MS-DOS and Windows for Workgroups 3.11. Um, so I know that um, what you actually need to do is type in Win 
to enter Windows. If you are lucky enough to have had a computer bought from someone like Packard Bell that came with Windows, it will have been set up to start Windows automatically so that you didn't need to mess around with the mess that was, comp that was MS-DOS. So you start Windows and you know after a wee bit of waiting you eventually see this. Okay now this does have a big black mouse pointer but that was added by me using some third-party software. Microsoft Windows 3.x it was the best version of Windows that had been thus far and really kind of put Microsoft Windows on the map as a viable alternative to Mac OS X, Amiga Workbench and you know all the other graphical user interfaces that were out there at the time but it was still quite cumbersome I mean where's all my files? What you know what's the deal with getting into my programs? Okay so it's Windows icons menus and pointers um, let's say you know I want to you know do that writing how do I get into it? Um, okay this computer has a copy of uh, Microsoft Word installed that's under Microsoft Office um, window uh, what do I do? Microsoft Office? Let's try that oh Microsoft Word uh, what do I do now? see it's, if you don't know what to do it really isn't all that intuitive. However, if you do know what to do, basically, you know, you can double click on things, you can actually get into programs that way. Um, <clears throat> here I'm actually using a program called PCM to emulate this. So the reason it's running so slow is because I've actually set it to emulate a 486 SX25 processor. Now, Word's a wee bit more friendly, got a tip of the day. But that's just Word, you know, it's not necessarily the rest of Windows. Um, a lot of Windows 3.1 programs, especially once it came with Windows 3.1, looked more like something like this. This is right. This is a word processor that comes with Windows. And yes, it's you know kind of self-explanatory. You know, you've got a blank document. You can type stuff in. Look. So once you're done writing your document, let's say um, actually let's say we're gonna write a wee letter here. Dear Winnie, thank you for inviting me to stay with you in Wyoming. I hope you enjoyed the cro <laughs> crotches. <laughs> Crotcheted tea cozies <laughs> that I made for you. I have tried your blueberry pie recipe and it worked out so great that my West Highland Terrier ate all of it up. So sadly there was none left for me. Anyway, hoping you are well. Yours, Faith, hang on, no it's um, sincerely, J. Wakefield. So I've written a letter to someone called Winnie. By the way, I've never visited anyone called Winnie, and I've never even set foot in the United States, let alone Wyoming. Um, so I want to save this document. Absolutely fine. Go to File, because I guess you kind of file a document. Save as. Um, okay, so uh, do I want to save it as... Um, letter to Winnie. Oh! Letter to Winnie, this file name is not valid. That's another 
limitation with Windu- with Windows three point one that um, the um, competing version of Apple's system operating system was um, did not have any problems with Windows three point one as with previous versions of Windows before it and MS DOS can only accept eight dot three letter file names so that's eight letters for the file name and three letters for the extension so that would be either wri dot doc or dot jpg or dot bmp <coughs> you know not bmp not bnp not british national party at least i hope not anyway um so you know i would actually literally have to save this as something like letter dot wri now, there were desktops actually made uh, by third-party developers, you know, that would make the process of using Windows slightly easier. For example, there was Norton Desktop, which was actually pretty good. A lot of people did use that. Um, there was HP's, HP's Shell. Uh, you had um, you had quite a few, actually. Um, and then there was uh, ones that were a bit more out there um, that kind of went about things with a completely different paradigm, the paradigm of a house, things such as Packard Bell's Navigator and even Microsoft had a stab at it with their Microsoft Bob product. Unfortunately, a lot of these desktop shells weren't really all that successful. And in the case of Microsoft Bob, it's kind of the butt of people's jokes nowadays, which is quite sad. But as good as Windows 3.1 was, it really could have done with a lot of improvement. I mean, let's just imagine, for example, I had a lot more programs installed on here. Actually, as you can see um, in some of my other videos, generally on a Windows 3.1 installation, I do have a lot more programs installed. The program manager can only accept so many program groups before it stops letting you add them. I mean, this is something that I counteract with yet another product that is supposed to help the Windows 3.1 user. Um, it doesn't necessarily, I mean, you can have it replace the default program manager shell, but I actually use it to supplement it. The program I'm talking about, of course, is Plugin. And with Plugin, I can actually create nested program groups, which is very useful. And is something that you can't actually do in Windows 3.1, you know, a standard. I mean, let's take this example. Let's say I wanted to copy the Microsoft Office program group to accessories. Well, first off, I couldn't because it's kind of overlapping it. Let's try doing it now, though. Is it copied? Is it? I don't know. No, it's not. So, really, it was a fantastic effort. But even Microsoft knew that they could do better. And in 1993, what they started was the development of something that was going to be much better. Sorry, I've been saying 1993 this entire time. Actually, the development for what would become Windows 95 actually started a little after Windows 3.1 was released in May of 1992. Now this next bit I am going to have to borrow from Wikipedia, so I'm very sorry about this, but let's continue. <coughs> it seems that the initial design and planning stage for Windows 95 can be traced back to around March 1992. Um, at this time, Windows for Workgroups 3.11 and Windows NT 3.1 were still in development. Now. Um, for all of you who wonder, Hey Jay, what's all this about Windows NT? And where does it fit in with Windows 95? Well, Windows NT was actually Microsoft's first fully 32-bit operating system, if you will. It, um, 
<coughs> it actually featured preemptive multitasking and unlike consumer oriented operating systems from Microsoft each program had its own set memory space so if a program crashed it would only do so in its own memory space that is something that continues to this day in Windows 10 you ever noticed how on your modern computer if a program crashes it'll be like oh this program stopped responding and then you can close out the program and the rest of your operating system will come off quite unscathed now remember how the same thing would happen in Windows 95, 98 and Millennium Edition and you would have to actually restart the entire computer well Windows NT's protected memory spaces for programs kind of stopped that happening anyway Microsoft's plan for the future was actually focused on something called Cairo. Nope, not that Cairo. A different Cairo. This Cairo would be Microsoft's next generation operating system which was based on Windows NT and being a new featuring a new user interface and object-based file system. But it was not planned to be shipped before 1994. Where have we heard that one before? Microsoft Neptune, anyone? Microsoft Blackcomb? WinFS? Oh yeah. Very good at this, at Microsoft. This was the um, this was the original uh, operating system that was never really meant to be. Now um, the object file system would um, it didn't ship with what later became uh, what Cairo became, but it evolved into WinFS. Another thing that we've kind of yet to see. Cairo did eventually become uh, partially implemented and that was in the form of Windows NT 4.0 which actually shipped in July 1996. At the time Windows 3.1 had been released, IBM had started shipping their OS 2 2.0 operating system. Now Microsoft realised that they were in need of an updated version of Windows that could support 32-bit applications and preemptive multitasking, but could still run on low-end hardware. Unfortunately Windows NT did not. The development of Windows Chicago there was started and planned for a late 1993 release. It became known as Windows 93 initially. The decision was made not to include a new user interface as this was planned for Cairo and to only focus on making installation configuration and networking easier. Windows 93 would ship together with MS-DOS 7.0, offering a more integrated experience to the user and making it pointless for other companies to create DOS clones. MS-DOS 7 was in development at the time under the codename Jaguar and could optionally run on top of a Windows 3.1 based 32-bit protected mode kernel called Cougar in order to better compete with DRDOS. The first version of Chicago's feature specification was finished on September the 30th 1992. Cougar was to become Chicago's kernel. Now Windows 95 was designed to be maximally compatible with existing MS-DOS and 16-bit Windows programs and device drivers, while offering a more stable and better performance system. Windows 95's architecture is an evolution of Windows for Workgroup's 386 Enhanced Mode. The lowest level of the operating system contains a large number of virtual device drivers, or VXDs, running in 32-bit protected mode and one or ver more virtual DOS machines running in virtual 8086 mode. The virtual drivers are responsible for handling physical drivers such as video and network cards emulating virtual devices used by virtual machines. Nope, not virtual PC. I'm thinking DOS prompt machines. Or providing various system services. 32-bit Windows programs are assigned their own memory segments which can be adjusted to any size the user wishes. Memory area outside the segment cannot be accessed by a program. If they crash, they do not harm anything else. Well, that was a theory anyway. Before this, programs used fixed 
non-exclusive 64K segments. While the 64 kilobyte size was a serious handicap in DOS and Windows 3.x, lack of guarantee of exclusiveness was the cause of stability issues because programs sometimes overwrote each other's segments. A crashing Windows 3.x program could knock out surrounding processes. To end users, MS-DOS appears as an underlying component of Windows 95. For example, it's possible to prevent loading the graphical user interface and boot the system into what's known as real mode DOS environment. The spark debate among users and professionals over what extent Windows 95 is an operating system or nearly a graphical shell running on top of MS-DOS. We'll come back to that later. When the graphical user interface was started, the Virtual Machine Manager takes over the file system related and desk related functionality. MS-DOS itself is demoted to a compatibility layer for 16-bit device drivers. This contrasts with earlier versions of Windows, which relies on MS-DOS to perform file and disk access. Keeping MS-DOS in memory allows Windows 95 to use DOS device drivers when suitable Windows drivers were unavailable. For example, Windows 95 will support running real mode CD-ROM drivers. Windows 95 is capable of using all 16-bit Windows 3.x drivers, and actually so is Windows 98. Yep, I've actually had Windows 98 running on the Super VGA 256 colour drivers. Let me tell you, because the colours aren't necessarily the same as those ones put out by Windows 9x 256 colour drivers, everything starts to look a wee bit strange. Contrary to Windows 3.1x, DOS programs running in Windows 95 do not need DOS drivers for the mouse, CD-ROM access and sound card. Windows drivers are used instead. HiMem.SYS is still required to boot into Windows 95. EMM386 and other memory managers, however, are only used by legacy DOS programs. In addition, config.sys and autoexec.bat settings aside from HiMem.SYS, have no effect on Windows programs. DOS games, which could not be executed on Windows 3.x, can run inside Windows 95. Games tended to lock up Windows 3.1 or cause other problems. On startup, the MS-DOS component in Windows 95 responds to a pressed F8 key by temporarily pausing the default boot process and presenting a DOS boot options menu, allowing the user to continue starting Windows normally, start Windows in safe mode, or exit to the DOS prompt. As in previous versions of MS-DOS, there's no 32-bit support, and DOS drivers must be loaded for mice and other hardware. Now, we're going to actually take a look at the Windows 95 user interface. So this is what the result of two years very hard work was. When you start a Windows 95 computer, it doesn't matter if you set it up or if you've bought your machine from Packard, Bell, Compaq, IBM, Hewlett Packard, or yes, even a silly English company called RM. This is what you would see. Windows 95 was the first version of Windows to not require you to have MS-DOS installed beforehand. You could install Windows 95 to a clean machine and you would always end up with it starting and taking you straight to the desktop. Now, Something that really, really does get on my nerves is that in all of those old Windows 95 adverts, it would say, Oh, DOS is completely gone now. You've got no messy DOS buildup. DOS is just, it's gone. It, it's not needed. This is full 32 bit. Well, they were lying. Because Windows 95 like Windows 3.1 and 3.0 and 2 and version 1 is actually just a program that sits on top of DOS. That's all it is. I don't care how well you manage to dress it up, that's just what it is. And the next two versions of Windows within the consumer line that came after it, Windows 98 and Windows Millennium Edition, 
Stell programs that set on top of MS-DOS. Um, <clears throat> yes, Windows 95 does have 32 bit support, which we will come into in a wee bit. But it is a hybrid kernel. It has a 16 bit base pretty much with 32 bit on top. Because it still runs under MS-DOS. Now, like I said before, you don't need to have MS-DOS installed beforehand. It actually comes with Windows 95. It actually installs DOS and Windows when you actually uh, go and install it. Now, the fact that it comes with DOS isn't a bad thing. In fact, it's actually a very good thing because a lot of people were still using MS-DOS based programs. So what happens if you wanted to run these programs within Windows 95? That's actually really quite simple. Again, we'll get into that. But for now, this is a desktop. And this is what you would have seen when starting your Windows 95 computer. Now, the desktop differs from Windows 3.1 in quite a number of ways. On Windows 3.1, it was just a grey thing. Now, it's a green thing. Well, teal, to be exact. But... Joking aside, on Windows for Art Groups, well, Windows 3.x, the desktop was only really used to store icons of minimized programs. And, you know, if you had your program maximized in Windows 3.1, it would look like all the other programs had disappeared, and there was no real easy way to get back to them. Now, however, this desktop does not store minimized program icons. What it stores is actual icons to programs that you can actually go to. A lot like the Apple Macintosh systems, later called Mac, o uh, Mac, uh, Mac OS. Um, you know, you can double click on any one of these icons, you know, and go to programs. But, if you are a brand new computer user, um, what you can do is well, the most obvious thing that you would do. You want to start using your computer? You click on start. Now, unfortunately, I'm actually emulating this in VMware. And this is the RTM version of Windows 95. For some reason, it's the um, VMware editions does not work too well with the mouse driver. So uh, please forgive me, you know, the mouse driver. The mouse pointer is going to go skating across the screen. But, that aside, this is actually really, really bad, but um, Windows 95, you know, it, it worked a lot better on a real computer. But, <clears throat> you go to start, you hover over the start button, you notice this wee yellow box. It's a tooltip. These came standard in Windows 95. Now, some Windows 3.x applications had them. But, that is because the developers had had to write the tooltips and the code used to display tooltips into the applications. Whereas now, they were actually a part of Windows themselves. And they were very useful to the users. Click here to begin. It's a start button. That is what you might want to click if you're brand new to computers. Let's say, once again, we we'll want to do some writing. Let's click start. What do we want? We want, well, there's all sorts here. There's programs, documents, settings, find, help, run, shut down. All pretty self-explanatory. I want to go to programs. Now, there's, there's all sorts of programs. It's just, you know, okay, some of the program groups, um, you know, still quite similar to 3.1 and to be honest maybe I was a wee bit unfair um, so, um, maybe I was, I was being quite unfair trying to simulate confusion um, at the accessories program group but I mean program manager does look quite unfriendly to someone who's never used a computer I know because I learned how to use a computer with Windows 3.1 and it was actually a little bit threatening a bit intimidating. Whereas this, it just seems to be so much better. 
you don't even have to click to get the menus to kind of cascade into sub menus. Look at that. So, you know, write has been upgraded to, um, has been replaced by WordPad. So if you wanted to write something, WordPad. You just click once and there it is. <clears throat> but if you wanted to use the uh, desktop icons as well to launch things, you could. You know, double click, let's say on my computer, you actually see the drives in your machine. So, your floppy drive, your hard drive, your CD-ROM drive, they're actually now represented by icons that are meaningful. Look, you've got your floppy drive is a picture of a diskette drive with a diskette next to it. The C drive is just kind of like, it looks like an old fashioned full height hard disk. CD-ROM drive, it's a drive with a CD next to it. Control panel, it's a folder with all sorts of tools. Printers, dial up networking. Just so much easier, you know, and to navigate, you just double click on the um, folders and you've probably noticed something else here my documents program files these are actually longer file names longer than eight characters now let's go back to that um, to that document shall we and this is another thing about windows whereas windows 1 and 2 were uh, file centric user interfaces as in you know you kind of just look through files Windows 3.x was uh, kind of program centric um, you saw your programs but your files it wasn't really that obvious how to get to them and quite often you would open up the program and then open up the file this it's more omnicentric you know it's just as easy to access programs as it is to access files so let's actually um let's actually go back into wordpad actually um what i want to do is i want to go back to the letter uh, that i wrote to winnie earlier on in this video and yes i have copied it to this virtual machine now <clears throat> it's not here um, but just like in earlier versions of Windows, file type, word for Windows 6, dot doc. No, it isn't one of those. It's a dot WRI. Okay, so maybe that's not changed. Obviously, some things will stay the same from version of Windows to version of Windows. But okay, we now have this document. Um, so let's say I actually wanted to resave that. That's quite easy to do. Go to File, Save As. Now I can either save it in the My Documents folder or I can save it to the desktop. And now I can give it a meaningful na file name. Letter to Winnie. And there we go. It's on the desktop. And that will open in whatever program is designed to open documents. Actually, in this case, I do have Microsoft Word installed. But this is a version of Word that was made for Windows 95. As you can see, it doesn't look much much different to uh, the version of Word that was originally made for Windows 3.1. But it has some tricks up its sleeve, like it supports larger file names. And another feature of Windows for workgroups 3.11 is uh, well another feature of Windows 95 rather is um, object linking and embedding let me demonstrate what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this picture of some balloons okay um, now first of all let's maximize it how are we gonna do that well I don't know we could click on the picture of this window that appears to be taking up the full screen. Hmm. What if we wanted to uh, restore it? Then we could, uh, I don't know, actually click the button of a window of a bunch of overlapping windows. How do you close out of a Windows 95 program? Oh, that's easy. 
you've got the big cross. Now that's amazing. You know, I mean, it's it's well, it was for me at the time. I quite like that. In a way, I find it quite funny. Just a wee cross. Like, no, don't want that. Boom, go away. It's like, go away. And something else, have you noticed? Any program that's open is displayed as a wee button on the taskbar. And this is something that at the Windows 95 launch event, Jay Leno did actually make fun of. So let me demonstrate. I'm going to open WordPad. Look. And actually, what we're going to do is we're going to try and maximize this. So, what we've got? <laughs> I'm going to change the channel. Like, uh, you know, like my mum changing the channel on the TV. Look. <laughs> I'm not going to repeat Jay Leno's jokes because those are his. But here's another feature. It didn't debut in Windows 95, but I will tell you this. It's actually a lot better implemented in Windows 95. Windows 3.1 had something called object linking and embedding. When Windows 95, we got the second version of that. And, you know, I found it to be uh, pretty stable. What is object linking and embedding, you might ask? Well, in order to actually show you what it is, why don't we make a birthday invitation? So, or, a, you know, just kind of any party invitation. And what we're going to do is we're going to use WordPad to make it. So what I'm going to do is, um, and uh, you'll notice as well, WordPad is making use of, um, you know, toolbars as well. Something that you didn't get with Windows right. And look at this, has colors. So party time. Now remember that picture of the balloons? Well, we're going to use that. How are we going to do that? We're actually going to copy it to the clipboard. Now again, you could do this with Windows for uh, Windows 3.x, but I found it to be um, quite a bit slower and quite a bit more cumbersome. And something else Windows 95 also has, right-click menus. Finally, the right mouse button could actually do something within Windows itself. Just like the tooltips, um, Application developers may or may not have actually uh, put in code that enables you to use the right mouse button. But, for the first time in Windows 95, it was actually made as kind of part of Windows itself. So, we're going to use these but What we're going to do is we're going to use this right-click menu to actually um, paste in the picture of the balloons. Boom! There it is! And if I wanted to make some changes, boom! It actually opens up the image within the program. It's, um, you know, that's, that's really pretty neat. And then once I'm done, just kind of closes it. And any changes I've made will be reflected. So, let's, uh, let's continue this invitation then. Once again, I would have to apologize. I have to apologize for this cursor. You know, this cursor that's skidding around. I, I, I just can't deal with it. There we go. We hope you can join us for Windows 95's 20th birthday on August 24th, 2015. Starts at 8pm 
at my local pub. Starts at 8pm at my local pub. Stovies and whiskey to be served, followed by a kale. Excellent. <laughs> well, how else would I? How else would we celebrate Windows 95's birthday in Scotland? So there you have it. There's the invitation. So once again, what I can do is I can try grappling with this mouse pointer and then I can actually go ahead and save this document or at least attempt to. It wasn't just basic things that Windows 95 was better at either. It was um, it was also quite a lot better at the um, kind of more advanced things. So, for example, you had something called plug and play. If you inserted a new piece of hardware, it would actually um, it would actually help you install it by using the new add new hardware wizard. So you'd just kind of follow these steps um, on screen to actually install the new hardware and if um, you had a disk with a driver on it it would uh, help you with um, installing the driver from that although Windows 95 itself did come with a lot of drivers for a lot of different pieces of hardware and in fact when you set it up it does actually detect all the hardware in the computer and installs what it can changing your display settings very simple as well in windows 3.1 you know if you wanted to change the resolution some drivers did give you an easy way of doing that other drivers you actually had to reinstall the driver in order to change that sort of stuff windows 95 not a problem you've got a resolution changer color depth changer you can change you know basically whatever your, uh, your display driver supports you know you can change um, in this case, either you know 32-bit color, 20, uh, 256 colors, or 16 colors, and just well, it's just kind of the same with most things. Windows 95 also included a couple things to help you online: the Microsoft Network Online Service and Inbox, Microsoft Exchange, that would either deal with them um, Microsoft Exchange Mail or um, internet mail but because of antitrust um, because of antitrust things and um, litigation and all sorts of stuff Windows 95 you could actually install it with a bunch of online services you know that would actually include installers for other things such as AOL, CompuServe, AT&T and Prodigy so you could actually um, choose to install one of those services as well. Again, you know, if you had a different internet service provider or online service, you know, just ask for an installation CD um, for Windows 95 and you're on your way. Um, if you wanted to set it up manually, again, quite a lot easier in Windows 95. So these long file names, they are all kind of thanks to the 32-bit uh, abilities of Windows 95. As is being able to run multiple programs at once. Windows 95 has just made that, um, you know, quite a bit better. You know, some people, I think, had difficulties running multiple programs in older versions of Windows, but in Windows 95, it is actually a lot better. Oh, and what about those old DOS programs? Well, that's quite um, that's quite easy as well. Just go to an MS DOS prompt, and then you can fire up your DOS program from there, and even get mouse support if it supports it. And what's more, 
Windows 95 can actually help you set up your DOS program um, for whatever it needs. So um, EMS memory, XMS memory, full screen, windowed graphics mode. Um, you know, it's it's all here. Fast drum emulation, dynamic memory allocation, DMA. Um, you can uh, EMS memory, XMS memory, all of that sort of stuff. It just made working with DOS programs easier in some cases than working with them in MS-DOS. But if you had programs that did need access to MS-DOS, you know, just MS-DOS on its own, well, that's quite easy as well. Because Windows 95 has an option to actually drop down to real DOS mode. Look, restart the computer in MS-DOS mode. And if you actually select that, it will do it. And we're actually in MS-DOS now. So just use the example edit MS-DOS editor program here. We're in. To get back to Windows, very easy. Just type exit and then Windows will restart. So what about power usage then? This was after all the caring sharing 90s and a lot of computers were coming with something on board called advanced power management, especially laptops. But it was also starting to seep into desktops within the mid 90s. Well, Windows 95 had support for that too. Let's have a look. Once again, go into the easy to use control panel. Um, power management, you can choose different um, power schemes and you can actually have it show a an option on the start menu called suspend. What is suspend you ask? Well let's say that let's say you want to leave the computer you know just for a wee bit just while you go off and have some lunch. Well you don't necessarily need to switch it off and then have to wait for it to boot up again. Quite simply what you can do go to start and then click on suspend and what that will do is that will actually put your computer on standby as long as your computer actually supported that which means it would stay powered on but would use less power and then when you were ready to actually come back to your computer you just kind of hit a key on the keyboard and then boom you're back where you left off magic um, <clears throat> On laptops, Windows 95 would actually have its own battery meter installed. And in later versions of Windows 95, you actually had quite a lot of control on, you know, how long the machine would remain powered on for, how long the display would remain powered on for, you know, and any kind of thing like that. And, of course, you still had screensavers. Only now... Windows 95 featured OpenGL technology, at least in some versions, so you could actually have 3D style screensavers, like a maze or you know, th things like that. So let's have a look. Um, I don't know actually if there's any 3D maze screensaver on this version. Actually, there isn't. But if you want to customize your computer, the colors, again, quite simple to do that. You know, I could, um, you know, Windows 95 comes with a few nice desktop backgrounds or you've got the, the patterns like in old versions of Windows. Remember those. Or you could just kind of go all cliche and have the old, the good old fashioned clouds background. However, Microsoft Windows 95 wasn't the only thing available for sale by Microsoft at the time. Of course, you could get Windows 95 Plus, which today might be considered DLC or an expansion pack. What it actually did was gave you a couple of neat features. So you got things like the compression agent. You could actually compress drives. Um, you got um, a schedule assistant which means you could actually schedule it to uh, do certain things like scan your hard disk for errors, defragment it, you know, all 
you know, at times that you wouldn't use a computer. And then you got some downright fun things to do. Let's have a look. Here you have a thing called desktop themes. Now, what desktop themes are, are kind of color schemes, mouse pointers, sound schemes, and desktop backgrounds that all fit within a particular theme. And obviously you got quite a lot of themes with Microsoft Plus. So being the liberal that I am, let's go for um, a theme that I might like. What about the 60s USA? Boom. And we get to see a preview of what it looks like. And we can choose, you know, to only change a certain part of it or change all of it. So, um, yeah. For now, though, let's just change all of it. Now, on a real Windows 95 machine, that would have taken quite a bit longer. But, the, uh, whoops. But, the, um, you have different sounds. Um, the icons for my computer and recycle bin and if it was installed network neighborhood have all kind of changed to kind of 60s-esque things. I like the CND logo for my computer. Oh, I wonder why. <laughs> and this purple color scheme though, we bet, shall we say extravagant? And this purple colour scheme, shall we say, uh, and this purple colour scheme, shall we say it's a wee bit extravagant? But anyway, what happens when you're done with Windows 95? Well, in Windows 3.1, you exited Windows, you were spat back out at the DOS prompt. You had to be confident that the hard disk had finished clicking before you actually reached for the power button. Windows 95, if your computer was one of the older ones, Windows 95 would actually shut the machine down and then when it was ready for you to turn it off, it would actually display a notice. It is now safe to turn off your computer. If you had one of the more modern machines with advanced power management, it would actually just switch the machine off automatically. And all, all you needed to do was go to start, shut down, shut down the computer, restart the computer, restart in MS-DOS mode. So just like everything else, it was easier in Windows 95. Please wait while your computer shuts off. And there you have it. If this were a real machine, it would be off. And I could actually just go ahead then and unplug it from the wall, you know, finish with the machine, go to bed, or whatever I would do after switching off a computer probably switch it straight back on again. So now that we've actually had a look at Windows 95, and let me just say, it can usually run quite a lot better than I was able to show it running in that Wii segment. Let's actually talk about its release and its promotion. So Windows 95 was released with great fanfare, as I'd said at the start of the video including a commercial featuring the Rolling Stones 1981 hit single, Start Me Up, which was a reference to the start button. There was also a parody version talking about Windows 95 sluggish performance on anything less than a high-spec computer of the time. It was widely reported that Microsoft paid the Rolling Stones between 8 and 14 million US dollars for the use of the song in the Windows 95 advertising campaign. According to sources at Microsoft, however, this was just a rumour spread by the band to increase their market value. And Microsoft actually paid a fraction of that amount. A 30-minute promotional video labelled a cyber sitcom featuring Jennifer Aniston and Matthew Perry was also released to showcase the features of Windows 95. 
Microsoft's $300 million advertising campaign, US dollars by the way, featured stories of people waiting in line outside to get a copy. In the UK, the largest computer chain, PC World, received a large number of oversized Windows 95 boxes, posters and point of sale material, and many branches opened at midnight to sell the first copies of the product. In the United States, the Empire State Building in New York City was lit to match the colours of the Windows logo. In Canada, a 328 foot or 100 meter banner was hung from the top of the CN Tower in Toronto. Copies of the Times were available for free in the United Kingdom, where Microsoft paid for 1.5 million issues, twice the daily circulation at the time. The release included a number of fun stuff items on the CD, including the now quite infamous 3D space rover game Hover. Windows 95 followed Windows for Workroots 3.11 with its lack of support for older 16-bit x86 processors, thus requiring an Intel 8386 or compatible. While the OS kernel is 32-bit, much code, especially the user interface, remains 16-bit for performance reasons, as well as the development time constraints. Much of Windows 95's UI code was recycled from Windows 3.1. This had a rather detrimental effect on system stability and led to frequent application crashes. The introduction of 32-bit file access in Windows for Workgroups 3.11 meant that 16-bit real mode MS-DOS is not used for managing the files while Windows is running. And the earlier introduction of the 32-bit disk access means that the PC BIOS is often no longer used for managing hard disks. DOS can be used for running old-style drivers for compatibility, but Microsoft discourages using them, as this prevents proper multitasking and impairs system stability. Control Panel allows the user to see which MS-DOS components are used by the system. Optimal performance is achieved when they are bypassed. The Windows kernel uses MS-DOS style rail mode drivers in safe mode, which exists to allow a user to fix problems relating to native protected mode drivers. So what did you need then to run Windows 95? The official system requirements were an Intel 8386 DX CPU of any speed, 4 megs of system RAM <coughs> and 50 to 55 megs of hard drive space, depending on the feature selected. These minimal claims were made in order to maximise the available market share of Windows 3.1 converts. This configuration would rely heavily on virtual memory and to be honest it was suboptimal for productive use on anything but single tasking large dedicated workstations. Also, in some cases, if any networking or similar components were installed, the system would refuse to boot with 4 megs of RAM. It was possible to run Windows 95 on a 386 SX, but this led to even less acceptable performance due to the 16-bit external data bus. To achieve optimal performance, Microsoft recommends an Intel 8486 or compatible microprocessor with at least 8 megs of RAM. Windows 95 may fail to boot on computers with more than approximately 480 megs of memory. In such cases, reducing the file cache size or the size of the video memory can help, the theoretical maximum according to Microsoft being 2 gigabytes. So what happened in the end then? Windows 95 was superseded by Windows 98, but could still be directly upgraded by both Windows 2000 Professional and Windows ME. On December the 31st, 2001, Microsoft ended its support for Windows 95, making it an obsolete product, according to the Microsoft lifecycle policy. Even though the support for Windows 95 has ended, the software has occasionally remained in use on legacy systems for various purposes. In addition, some video game enthusiasts choose to use Windows 95 for the legacy systems to play old DOS games, although some other version of Windows such as Windows 98 could also be used for this kind of purpose. Now what kind of ridiculous, fat, liberal, blue-haired, girlfriendless Scotsman would do such a thing, you might ask? I really don't know, and to be honest, I don't want to know. Oh, wait. Moving on swiftly there. Um, 
Most copies of Windows 95 were on CD-ROM, but a floppy version could also be had for older machines. The retail floppy disk version of Windows 95 came on 13 DMF formatted floppy disks, while OSR 2.1 doubled the floppy count to 26. Both versions exclude additional software that the CD-ROM might have featured. Microsoft Plus for Windows 95 was also available on floppy disks. DMF was a special 19 sector format that Microsoft used to store 1.7 megs on floppies rather than the usual 1.44 megabytes. While the floppy edition of Windows was normally on 3.5 inch disks, a 5 and a quarter inch version could be specially ordered as well. So let's now talk a wee bit about the web browser. Nope, not Microsoft Edge. I'm actually meaning Internet Explorer. Windows 95 originally shipped without Internet Explorer, and the default network installation did not install TCP over IP, the protocol used on the internet. At the release date of Windows 95, Internet Explorer 1.0 was available, but only in the Plus add-on pack for Windows 95, which was a separate product. The Plus pack did not reach as many retail consumers as the operating system itself. It was mainly advertised for its non-internet related add-ons such as themes and better disk compression. And at the time of Windows 95's release, the web was being browsed mainly with a variety of early web browsers such as NCSA Mosaic and Netscape Navigator. And these browsers were promoted by such products as Internet in a Box. Windows 95 OEM Service Release 1 was the first release of Windows to include Internet Explorer version 2.0 with the operating system. While there was no uninstaller, it could be deleted easily if the user desired. OEM Service Release 2 included Internet Explorer 3. The installation of Internet Explorer 4 or the OSR 2.5 version pre-installed on a computer gave Windows 95 the active desktop and the browser integration into Windows Explorer, known as the Windows Desktop Update. Kinda made it look a wee bit more like Windows 98. The CD version of the last release of Windows 95, OEM Service Release 2.5, version 4.00.950C, includes Internet Explorer 4 and installs it after Windows 95's initial setup and first boot is complete. Only the 4.x series of the browser contained the Windows Desktop Update features, so anyone wanting the new shell had to install Internet Explorer 4 with the desktop upgrade before installing a newer version of Internet Explorer. Now this was something that I found when I was trying to update the shell on my Compact Presario 2240 back in 2001. You see, at the time, um, <coughs> at the time, Internet Explorer 4 had actually been deleted to save space, but because it had been deleted, it had gone back to the previous shell, which neither me or my mum actually liked at the time. To be honest, I prefer having the active desktop where I can, so that I can actually use the I can actually use the address bar in my computer in Windows Explorer windows. I tried installing IE 5.5 but it remained with the old shell. And it was then that I realised that a lot of the machines that I'd seen in action with IE4 had the active desktop update. So by powers of deduction, I thought, hey, what if I try installing that and then trying installing IE5? I did so, and it worked. <laughs> really quite confusing, and to be honest, I think you should have been able to get IE5 with the active desktop update. But then again, that's just me. The last version of Internet Explorer supported on Windows 95 is Internet Explorer 5.5, which was released in 2000. Windows 95 ships with Microsoft's own dial-up online service called the Microsoft Network. Unfortunately, I'm not necessarily able to show you that running. A number of editions of Windows 95 have been released. Only the original release was sold as a shrink-wrapped product. Later editions were provided only to computer original equipment manufacturers for installations on new PCs. 
For this reason, these editions are known as OEM Service Releases OSR. Microsoft initially indicated to make updates available for Windows 95 every six months in the form of service packs, like those in Windows NT. The growing availability of internet access meant that Windows updates could now be downloaded from Microsoft directly. The first service pack was made available half a year after the original release and fixed a number of small bugs. The second service pack mainly introduced support for new hardware, most no notably support for hard drives larger than 2GB in the form of the FAT32 file system. This release was never made available to end users directly and only sold through OEMs with the purchase of a new PC. A full third service pack was never released, but two smaller updates to the second were released in the form of a USB supplement, OSR 2.1, and the Windows Desktop Update, OSR 2.5. Both were available as standalone updates as, and as updated disk images, shipped by OEMs. OSR 2.5 is notable for featuring a number of changes to the Windows Explorer, integrating it with Internet Explorer 4.0. This version of the Explorer looks very similar to the one featured in Windows 98. Many features that have became a key component of the Microsoft Windows series, such as the Start menu and the Taskbar, originated in Windows 95. Neil MacDonald, a Gartner analyst, said, If you look at Windows 95, it was a quantum leap in difference in technological capability and stability. CNET said, By the time Windows 95 was finally ushered off the market in 2001, it had become a fixture on computer desktops around the world. So that really is the story of Microsoft Windows 95. We've not necessarily seen anything quite like it in terms of evolution from one version of Windows to the next. It really has had the biggest paradigm shift of any Windows release. And yes, that includes Windows 8's half-baked idea of the new user interface. See, the thing with Windows 95 is that everything was integrated into the new Explorer. I mean, sure, you'd run a Windows 3.1 program and you would only be able to use eight character file names like you were in Windows 3.1. But everything took on a look and feel similar to that on the Windows 95 desktop, even older programs. There was no jarring move from one user interface to another like there is in Windows 8 and 8.1. And the start menu, well, the start menu has proved itself time and again to be the best way to navigate a Windows computer, at least in my opinion and the opinion of so many Windows users. You know, Windows 95 played such a role in bringing computers to the masses and brought Microsoft one step closer to Bill Gates' dream of a computer on every desktop and in every home running Microsoft software.